Y'all doing good? Good. I want to tell you the story of a man named Epimenides. I worked really hard to perfect how I said that name. Uh, don't get used to it. I may mix it up a couple of times throughout the sermon. But I want to tell you the story about this man, Epimenides. I have a picture of him and his uh, stone cold stare. Uh, that's him. You like that joke? Uh, so in 6th century BC, this guy was a philosopher, he was a poet, he was an intellect, intellectual leader, but at that time in Greece, a plague was wiping out the population by the thousands. Everyone was dying of this plague, and so people came to their intellectual leaders and said, what are we supposed to do about this? Now, the Greeks were known for worshiping many gods, so the, the rational conclusion was we must have offended a god. Not God, a God. But which one did we offend? Because there are so many that they worshipped. Maybe, just maybe, we missed one. They made sacrifices to Zeus, Poseidon, and other gods out there, but maybe they missed one. So this man, Epimenides, came up with a brilliant solution. He came to them and he says this. Here's my plan. He released hungry sheep into the countryside and instructed men to follow those sheep and wherever they would lie down. He believed that since hungry sheep would never lie down, they would continue to graze. So if a sheep were to kneel down and lie down, they must have pleased the God. That's where God showed up. So he says, when that happens, when you see a sheep kneel down and start laying down, I want you to build an altar for this God. There's even a historical record of a prayer that he offered up, and it says this, O oh, thou unknown God, behold, this plague is afflicting, afflicting this city, and if indeed you... Feel compassion to forgive and help us. Behold this flock of sheep. Reveal your willingness to respond. I plead by causing any sheep that pleases you to lie down upon the grass instead of grazing. Choose white if white pleases, black if black delights. And those you choose, we sacrifice them to you, acknowledging our pitiful ignorance of your name. So the sheep are released out into the countryside, and sure enough, one by one, Sheep would start kneeling down instead of grazing. And so workers would say, another one. And masons would run over with stone and with mortar and automatically start building an altar. They would sacrifice that poor sheep and they would build an altar this, to this God that they now have pleased. But the question remained, what God was pleased? Epimenides still had another plan. He says, I have a solution for you. And here's another quote where it says, there is a way. Simply ascribe the words agnosto theo to an unknown God upon the side of each altar. Nothing more is necessary. I don't know the God's name, but just put agnosto theo, the unknown God, because we pleased him and he has spared us. Now, crazy enough, over the following weeks, the following months of plague actually did go away. Something was happening, but they had no idea what was happening. They had no idea about an unknown God. They had no idea that possibly that there was a God out there who was showing them mercy, showing them grace, showing them favor. So instead of worshiping this new God that they may have not known of, they went back to their idolatry, went back to worshiping many, many gods. It would be another 600 years later when they finally heard of this unknown God again. Archaeologists have discovered shrines of this unknown God. We have a picture of one of them this actually, this shrine is actually a picture, there we go, of one of the shrines of the unknown God. That's one of them that's been preserved over history. Now, ancient cities, you would know this, were built around what they worshipped. Great architecture, cathedrals, synagogues, all these things were built up, monuments, statues, shrines, to support and honor what they worshipped. And the Greeks worshipped many, many things. It was full of shrines. Check out this picture of just some of the idolatry that was known and found in Greece, in Athens. Athens was the political and intellectual capital of the world at the time. Now, at the time, Rome was in charge. Rome was in power, but yet the Greeks still had all the influence. Because if there was any intelligence, it came out of Greece. If there was any political insight, it came out of Greece. This is a place of Socrates, Aristotle, Plato. Great academies and schools were built up in this time period, devoted to human intellect and human understanding and reason. But yet, it was also a place of deep worship. Deep worship of deities of all kinds. It was a city of statues and shrines and of deities and political leaders lining the streets. One, one person said this, It was said that there were more statues of the gods in Athens 
than all the rest of Greece put together. And that in Athens, it was easier to meet a god than a man. Shrine after shrine, God after God, the temple of Zeus, whom they believed that all life came from, Athena, Poseidon, Demetri, Hermes, Dionysus, and the Muses. They loved to worship. The intellectual of the capital of the world who looked down upon those who were religious still were deeply devoted to their worship. They didn't see themselves as religious, yet they had a shrine to the unknown God just to appease the ones they may have missed. One could say they weren't superstitious, they were just a little stitious. They too wondered, as we all do, who is out there? What is out there? What is out there for us? What's the purpose in life? Where does this desire and need to worship come from? It starts with our idea and understanding of God. Now, whoever you meet in this life, everybody has an idea and understanding of God. Now you say, well, what about atheists? No, that's their starting point. What is the starting point for the rest of us? I love what A.W. Tozer once said. So what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Worship is pure or base as a worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. For this reason, the greatest question before the church is always God himself. And the most pretentious fact about any man is not what he at a given time may say or do, but what he is in deep heart conceives God to be like. Everyone starts with a question, who do I think God is? What do I think God is like? And how we view God will determine the object of our worship. God is our starting point. And out of our view of God, our worship is reflected in your values, your desires, your pursuits, and your beliefs. It's not hard to look around the world and see the number of things people worship today, right? The, the idols of our heart are so numerous to count. And that there are a lot of things in this life that we worship that are so good in and of themselves. Yes, we can talk about the evil things that we ultimately worship and idolize, but let's talk about the good things. There are good things in this life that we worship that are good. But the problem is they were never meant to carry the God-sized weight we place on them. Not only the seat of heaven is meant for God, the throne of heaven, the throne of your heart is meant for God alone, nothing else. Nothing else can carry that burden. Nothing else will ever satisfy. They were never designed to take that seat. But one thing can easily happen. One thing that easily can happen that we're going to talk about today is the temptation that we may not necessarily see creeping into our lives. We can give in to the temptation to believe in a God who's too small. We can believe in a God who is too small. What do, what do I mean by that? We reduce the almighty God of the universe to something we can manage, something we can control, or we begin to give God-like weight to things that won't satisfy. Pastor J.D. Greer said this, I've come to see that the problem, my lack of faith, my passionless heart, and my struggle to surrender came from a fundamental deficiency in my vision of God or my idea of God. The God I imagined in my heart was not the same tr God who reveals himself through scriptures. I had traded the true God for a much smaller version. Where does this come from? This idea of reducing God, the smaller version of God, is often one that we have created over time through influence, societal factors, cultural influence, and images that we see of God. If I said, what does God look like? You may have a thousand different opinions of what that even happens or what that even looks like. But really, if we truly want to see what it truly is, for what it is, we are worshiping a God who is formed into our image. We are worshiping a God who is formed into our image. Instead of worshiping the God who created us, formed us into his image, we worship and believe in the God that looks like us, thinks like us, sounds like us, believes like us. And next thing you know, we are saying we are not like God, but God is like us. Voltaire said this, in the beginning God created man in his own image and man has been trying to repay the favor ever since. Think about it. Think about the wonder of God that you had as a child. 
when you first knew that the God that spoke the world into existence is also breathing life into you, and you were amazed and you were astounded. Over time, opinions started being formed, interpretations started being thrown at you, and all of a sudden you kind of, you kind of lost the awe of God. Because now you don't have awe anymore. Now you have something so much smaller. Now you have the God that you want. Now you have the God that you can understand, that you can rationalize, that you can explain. And you have a God who would never operate out of, outside of your expectations of him. No longer you have a God who is able to operate outside of your understanding. A finite being trying to control an infinite God. Tozer goes on to say, left to ourselves, we tend immediately to reduce God to manageable terms. We want to get him where we can use him or at least know where he is when we need him. We want a God, we want a God we can some, in some measure control. We need the feeling of security that comes from knowing what God is like. And he is like, of course, a composite of all the religious pictures we have seen, all the best people we've ever known or heard about, and all the sublime ideas we have ever entertained. And just like the people who made sacrifices of something they did not truly know, and they created for themselves, we have given our worship and our devotion to something we too have created. We have become ignorant in what we worship. So today I want to challenge all of us to consider we must examine the God we worship. We must examine the God we worship to see if it is the one that we have created or the Holy One who has created us. We're going to spend time in Acts chapter 17 today. The Apostle Paul was a man traveling along a journey, a man of radical conversion. He was very passionate and zealous for the God he believed in. But it wasn't until he had an encounter with the risen Jesus that he realized the God he was serving also came down in flesh and gave himself up for him. They truly believed in Jesus. And his life was changed forever. That this God that was so distant and removed was now present in the form of a person willing to lay down his life for his people. His mission became to tell the world all about that Jesus. So he would travel from town to town, all throughout the countryside, all throughout Asia and the known world, to tell people about this Jesus. One journey took him to the city of Athens, a city we looked at just a moment ago. And here, he would encounter idolatry of the human hearts as he examined their philosophies, their thought, their academies, and their worship. He had just left a town called Berea, and in Berea he found faithful Jews who are worshiping God. And when he spoke to them about Jesus, they were examining the scriptures to see if what he said was true. That's a great environment to be in. <laughs> hey, I, I know about this Messiah. Let's look for it ourselves. He left Berea and he comes to Athens. This is a completely different arena now. One far different. Instead of people eager to search the scriptures, he had people eager to debate him and challenge him in his thinking. And he's forced into a position of reasoning and challenging the intellectual thought of the culture. So as Paul's walking around the city streets, it says this, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. As he looked around the city landscape, all he saw were the idols they worshipped. Craig Keener says, from an aesthetic standpoint, Athens was unrivaled for its exquisite architecture and statues. Paul's concern is not for the aesthetics, though, but the impact that idols have on the human heart. As he moves throughout the city, grieved by their idolatry, he encounters a group of people that would challenge him, two different groups of people, called the Epicureans and the Stoics. The Epicureans were a group of people, disciples of a man named Epicurus, who believed that pleasure was the greatest good. The most worthy pursuit of all people was the pursuit of of good and good pleasure. This meant that pleasure in the sense of tranquility, freedom from pain, disquieting passions and fears, especially the fear of death. He taught that the gods took no interest in human affairs, so therefore organized religion was not something to be pursued. The gods would never punish evildoers. One famous quote from a, from a philosopher that followed this teaching says, there's nothing to fear in God, nothing to fear, feel in death. 
good can be obtained and evil can be endured. This group of people, they were naturally atheists. They were naturally, God was distant and removed, let alone he didn't even exist. Now, the second group of the Stoics, they followed a man named Zeno, who was from Cyprus, and his name, uh, the name Stoic comes from a place where he would teach, the Stoa, part of a specific, uh, specific part of Athens. He taught them that living in harmony in nature was the most important thing. They were pantheists, which basically means that God was in everything, God was everything. You and I would therefore then be what? Gods. They believed that God was everywhere. A famous poet who follows the same line of teaching, you may have even heard this famous poem called Invictus. This is very much a Stoic ideology. It says, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. Two different groups of people representing two very different theological thoughts. For one group, there was no God, only the pursuit of pleasure. If there was a God, he was distant and removed and took no interest in humanity. The other group believed that all things were God. All things and God was in everything. So they saw themselves as sufficient because they themselves too were God. So Paul steps in and begins to reason with these two different groups of people and begins to use their own language against them to show that their heart, their idols of their heart were so insufficient. Their view of God was so lowly and insufficient. So they look back at him and they say, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating for foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Verse 19, then they took him out and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know this new teaching that you are presenting. The Areopagus was a council of elite members of society. Upwards of 100 people made up this council. If there was ever an intellectual thought, a new idea, it would go before this council, and they would debate whether it was a cult, a new way of thinking, or if the the theology was sound. They would evaluate potential lecturers who would come up and spend time performing their lectures, their studies before an audience. Verse 20, it says, They say to him, You are bringing some strange idea to our ears. This is intriguing. We would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent time doing nothing but talking about listening to the latest ideas. Sounds kind of familiar. We do nothing but talk. (laughs) These are the people rooted and established in their ideologies and their practices, but the, the thought of something new intrigued them. So they wanted to know more. So Paul took advantage of this opportunity and of their curiosity their, their, their religious and philosophical positions, and they found a way to use their thoughts to bring the message of Jesus and the good news. Paul then stood up at the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with an inscription, Agnostotheo, to an unknown God. So you are very ignorant the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. And here's the story of Jesus. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and the earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if God needed anything. Rather, he gives himself, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. He says, the gods you serve, you people of Athens, are so small. They are not even gods at all. There is one who is above all and is over all. He spoke the entire world into existence. He is the Lord of heaven. He is the Lord of earth. He is not distant and removed. He is very, very close. He's basically arguing that this God is supreme. This God is sovereign. This God is sufficient. This God is Savior. He's greater than anything we can create or imagine, higher than any human thought or reason, He cannot be confined to any temple we create or any box we attempt to put him in that fits our understanding, our opinion. And he goes on to challenge their understanding. He even quotes some of their poets. Some even say he's quoting Epimenides. He says, from one man he made all nations, that they should inhabit the entire earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this, listen to this, so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though... He is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move 
and have our being. As some of your poets have said, we are his offspring. They're poets. People like Epimenides believe that we were the descendants of Zeus. And now he's saying, hey, no, Zeus is nothing. God is the one who brings life. God is the one who brings death. In God you move. In God you exist. God brings life to you. You are his offspring. Verse 29. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone or image made in human design or skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Their line of thinking, he's showing them, was foolish. And he revealed deep ignorance, which God now says deserves repentance. He was not a distant God who was not concerned with his creation. That was not concerned with his people. No, he said God was here. God was with them. God has come near now. What they did not know could now be known. What they could not understand could now be understood. Verse 31, it says, For he, God, has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, meaning Jesus. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him, Jesus, from the dead. The defining moment of this argument, the defining moment of what Paul believed in, the empty tomb, the resurrection. He says this is not just another philosophical leader like Plato or Socrates. This is not just another thought leader like the rabbis or other other religious leaders. No, no, no. This is God in flesh. He came from heaven to earth to live a life that you and I could not live, and he did not stay dead when he went into the tomb. He rose up from the grave, and at that, everything shifted. It says this, when they heard this, verse 32, about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. I love this. Some of the people became Followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Paul showed them a greater God. He showed them the true God, one who is worthy of worship and devotion, one that wasn't distant, but one that cared so deeply that he came from heaven to earth as a person. He didn't require sacrifices like their sacrificial system because he would sacrifice himself. No longer did mankind need to search for that which was unknown because what they could not see had now made himself known to his people. And it says he was right here reaching out for them. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any of us. God pursued his people. God pursued his people by sending Jesus. And listen today, God is still pursuing you. He is still pursuing you. He's still pursuing those who do not yet know him. He's actively in courtship trying to woo you over to him, trying to reveal himself to you, trying to show who he is so that we would seek him and find him and reach out for him. I imagine the Apostle Paul walking through the city streets of Clarksburg. He would see the great architecture, the multiple places of worship, the memorials, the statues of historical figures, the stadiums devoted to sport and leisure. And I think he would look upon all of us and see the idolatry in all of our hearts, and I think it would grieve him. He would be grieved by our devotion to the idols that we've created and the gods that we now follow, the small views of God Almighty. He would say, people of Clarksburg, people of Clarksburg Baptist Church, people of America, people of 2023, I see that you are religious in every single way, but you are ignorant of what you do not know. You are ignorant of what you worship. And there was a time when God would overlook such ignorance, but things have changed because God has made himself known. God is making himself known every single second. And he did this so that you and I, that we would seek him and reach out to him and possibly find him. Are we doing that this morning? Are we seeking the one who sought after us? Are we reaching out to the one who spread his arms to reach out to you? Are we trying to find the one who created us and longs to be in relationship with him? We have to examine our hearts and see what we are actually worshiping. Is it something that we've created? Is it something that's a small view of God that fits only our imagination? 
Or is it a God who created us and intimately pursues us? Even though he cannot be contained by any temple or any box of our imagination, he is not far out of reach. I love that. He's not distant and removed. He is right here next to us in this very moment, reaching out to us. He's right by you, reaching out to you today, hoping you would just take hold of him who is trying so hard to take hold of you. And he did so by reaching his arms out on the cross to show you that he wants to be with you. See the majesty and the greatness of Almighty God and the fullness and all of his holiness and fall down and worship him. Not just with our songs, not just with our offering, but with our very breath that he's given in our lungs and our very life that he gives us every single day. And worship him. Take hold of Jesus. Epimenides cried out to the unknown God for mercy and for hope. And there's a world around us today who is crying out to an unknown God for mercy and for hope and for love, trying to figure out where we're supposed to go in this life. Where should we find hope? Where should we find love? Where should we find compassion and mercy? And we're sitting over here, we're like, I know that God. I know who he is because he's made himself known to me. Christians, that's all of us. He's made himself known to us, and we have the ability and the authority to go out and make him known to the nations, to the city streets of Clarksburg, to the schools you work in, to where you go to work every single day. You have the opportunity to show mercy, compassion, and grace, but don't show a God who is limited to your own understanding. Don't show a God who only agrees with your lack of compassion. Don't show a God who only agrees with your prejudice. Don't show only a God who understands what you say. Don't show a God who only votes like you, thinks like you, and sounds like you. Show them the God of the universe who spoke the world into existence and speaking life into all of us today. Show them the God who says, I will give you my word to show you who I am. We need to see God in his fullness because the world is desperate to know that God. They're turning to every single thing, trying to figure out how to sacrifice and appease the gods. Sure, they're not building altars and killing sheep, thanks be to God, but they are bowing down to idols every single day, looking for salvation, looking for sufficiency, looking for supremacy, and yet we have a God who has all of those things. We know that which is unknown. He has made himself known to us. This world needs to know who Jesus is. So with every eye closed and every head bowed, spend time thinking through this idea. God, thank you for the simple and yet powerful reality that you sought us out. God, you're not distant and removed. You're not far off out of creation, not involved. God, you are so intimately involved. You revealed yourself by sending your son, Jesus, to step into our brokenness, to step into our mess, to step into our broken lives so that he could step every single day, step by step with his creation, empathizing with his creation, knowing the pains of death, knowing the pains of struggle, knowing the pains of trial so that he could understand human suffering. And God, thank you that Jesus came to live a life that we could not live. God, when you demanded holiness, when you demanded perfection, it was all completed in Jesus. God, thank you for seeking us out. So for those of us here today who say we know you, God, who say we believe in you, God, God, reveal in our hearts where we are placing idols on your throne and removing you from that. God, show us where the idols we have developed, the idols we have formed, the images we have created are more a a revelation of who we are, not who you are, God. God, show us where we are falling short and bowing down to these idols. Show us where we are falling short and giving all of our devotion and energy to these very things. God, you are not served by in that way. You are not worshiped in that way. So God, rip those idols from our life. God, we lay those down at your altar. We lay those down at the foot of the cross of Calvary, knowing that we can put all of our hope and trust in you. God, and those here today who do not know you yet, God, I pray that the last few moments have shown what you have done to show yourself to those people. What you have done to show your love and your compassion and your mercy and grace to them. 
God, that you sought them out individually, that they were on your mind when you went to the cross of Calvary, they were on your mind as you rose up out of the grave, and they are still on your mind as you still try to pursue them by the power of your Holy Spirit. And God, I pray today that they see that, they hear it, and it blows them away. So much so that they come to grab hold of you, because God, you've taken hold of them. So that's you today. I pray that you pray something like this. God, thank you for creating me in your image. Thank you for making me like you. God, I, I fall short because of what sin has done in this world, what sin is doing in my life. But thanks be to God that you sent Jesus for me. God, I want to follow you. I want to praise you. I want to live my life for you. So God, today in this moment, I take hold of your son, Jesus, and I put all my faith and trust in his supremacy, his sufficiency, and his salvation. So if that's you today, I pray that you make it known by writing on the connect card. You make it known by telling somebody next to you, be bold. And God, for the rest of us, as we worship, God, we seek you with our song. We seek you with our praise. And God, we worship you fully in all of who you are, all of your fullness, all of your holiness. God, we love you. We praise you. And it's in your son's name we pray. And everybody said, amen.